You can define standards in a number of ways. I've come up with eight. Maybe you can think of a few more. First are physical characteristics. If you purchase milk that is 1% fat, you can be sure that it has lower fat content than milk with 2% fat, but higher fat than fat-free milk. Next are physical dimensions. If you rent a DVD, you know that it'll fit into a player because DVD cases are standardized. Then we have consistency. If your teenage son hosts a Friday night fright party for his friends and rents five horror DVDs, he's sure that all five movies will fit in his DVD player. Performance. If you live in the United States and buy a power hedge trimmer rated at five horsepower, you can be confident that it will have more power than a three or four horsepower trimmer because of electrical standards set by the Underwriters Laboratories UL. Then we have safety. When you use your hedge trimmer, it should also be safe to run. In the US, groups such as the Consumers Union, CU, have made great strides in the safe operation of products. Next are environmental conditions. In many parts of the world, nations require that businesses protect the environment and discharge waste by following standard practices. Regarding communication, barcoding, for example, benefits from standards. In the past, this technology was difficult to use because of the lack of standards, which led to too many conflicting designs. And then we have operating capabilities. Material Requirements Planning, MRP, standardized software that helps you know what to order and when to order it, is an example of a standard used by production firms. Despite the many MRP choices, all MRP software provides the same basic features, such as units of measure and standard or target cost. Okay. I hope you have a good grasp on the vital aspects of standards. Let's move on and see how we can review and assess them, which is commonly known as auditing. As with standards, auditing has been a central activity for hundreds of years. It began with examining goods sent from one country to another and comparing received items to a master list. In the 1800s, auditing helped make sure that a farmer received a special birthday gift, for example, a puppet from France for his daughter. Many people misuse the word audit. They think it means spending time to find out what's wrong. But an audit is more than reviewing what a person does or how a process performs. Its main purpose is to produce useful information to help organizations improve. Auditors look to see if goods and services conformed conform to preset and agreed to criteria. They compare performance against a standard and record the variances they find. Audits come in two types, internal and external. While laws provide the basis for some audits, customers also audit suppliers on a regular basis based on their own criteria. In the United States, I think the most startling type of audit is one that you'll learn of from a letter sent to your home or business. It has this return address, U.S. Treasury Department Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. I hope none of you ever receive this type of letter. Okay, now that we set the stage, let's examine the features of an audit. First, regardless of what type of audit takes place, why it's done or who performs it, all audits have these features. They are legitimate. An audit must be reasonable. They're of little benefit if they fulfill a hidden agenda or serve a conflict of interest. Audits aren't too useful if an auditor has a grudge and points out trivial details. On the other hand, if an auditor is your best friend and reports that all is well, 
when in fact this is not the case, this doesn't help either. An auditor must be free of bias. It isn't much good to have a biased person collect the wrong data and paint a false picture when you want just the opposite. This won't help you improve processes and reduce costs. Next, audits are purposeful. If an auditor shows up and states, I'm here to have a look around and see what goes on, that's not much of a purposeful audit. Before you embark on an audit, you need to plan. You need an agenda that specifies the areas and topics you'll assess. During the audit, you need to stick to your agenda and avoid going on a fishing trip looking for trouble. Audits include qualified personnel. An auditor must be able to use criteria and know what type and how many facts to gather. This is a skilled activity. As evidence of the skill, many auditors are certified or licensed. All auditors should undergo an initial training program and also attend periodic refresher courses. To maintain integrity, I recommend auditing the auditor to reveal and exploit improvement areas. Audits are also usually scheduled. Most auditors announce their visit in advance. One audit I can think of that isn't scheduled is one held by the United States Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA. A DEA agent will show up at a company and ask to speak with the person who manages controlled substances. Auditors usually schedule their visits to give you time to prepare and also confirm the plan audit date. Audits are visible. They should not take place in secret. Everyone in your company should know about an audit. Audits are reviewed. Auditors also discuss, often discuss their results called findings before they create an issue or report. They do this to make sure that the facts are straight. They re this review also forces an auditor to be clear and direct. Auditors report findings. They write a final report to relate their findings, usually within a few days of the audit. And audits are responded to. Within 30 days, the CEO, president, or a designee, often the quality manager, reviews the final report and sends a formal response. He or she then creates action plans to address audit findings. Okay, you now have a good handle on audit, audit basics, so let's move on and explore the various types of audits and check out what type of challenges auditors face. The three major types of audits are operational, compliance, and financial. Since this isn't a finance course, We'll briefly touch on a financial audit as it relates to compliant audits. Operational and compliance audits are used extensively. Operational audits are also known as management audits. Their goal is process improvement. They focus on a firm's efficiency, doing things the right way, and effectiveness, doing the right things. This form of auditing started to become popular during the early days of the quality movement in the late 1970s. A unique aspect of operational audits is that they sometimes don't rely on standards, in this case, documented procedures. When procedures aren't available, auditors provide input for what they believe should happen based on company goals and other companies' best practices. Conducting an operational audit and reporting results are more difficult than any other type of audit. It's harder to evaluate efficiency and effectiveness than to compare results with standards. These audits usually center on organizational structures, computer operations, production methods, and sales practices. Because of the many processes used by operations around the world, it's not easy to describe what takes place during a typical operational audit. For example, one auditor 
may review how company leaders decide to buy fixed assets, land, equipment, and buildings, while another auditor may analyze how well customer service takes care of sales orders. Let's assume that my colleague Skip audited the plant layouts for a multi-site corporation. Skip might ask these questions. Did the facility department approve all plant layouts? Has a study of the plant layout been done in the past five years? Does each piece of equipment operate at its optimal level? Does the layout facilitate the movement of new products? Does the layout aid the flow of finished goods to distribution centers? And does the layout provide for employee safety? When an operational audit becomes very detailed, it becomes a functional audit. Suppose that you manage the final test unit for a large data rescue firm and you're not happy with your unit's recent results. You ask me to audit your area. After I complete my visit, I find that new hire training is a major problem. When I audit your training process, I am performing a functional audit. Let's move on to compliance audits. The purpose of a compliance audit is to find out if an auditee, the person, department, or company being audited, follows procedures or laws set forth by an authority. When you conduct this type of audit, you usually report results to a specific person in an organization. If you audit a public agency, your findings may be part of the public record. Let's look at three examples of compliance audits. Perhaps you've taken part in one of them. First is a regulatory audit. In the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the Occupational Safety and Health Agency, OSHA, regularly visits firms. Each agency maintains a long list of standards that many firms must meet to protect consumers and workers. Next are financial audits. To meet generally acceptable accounting practices, GAAP, and to report financial information accurately, companies invite external third-party accountants, often certified public accountants, CPAs, to review their policies and procedures. And then we have tax audits. Government agents perform these types of audits to make sure companies report tax liability properly and pay taxes on time and in the right amount. As our world becomes more complex, auditing will become more difficult as first-hand information is less available and secondary information is less reliable. Not a pretty picture. What are the reasons for this? First, it has to do with remote locations. As firms continue to spread out around the planet, it's less likely that decision makers have much first-hand knowledge about their companies, suppliers, and customers. For example, in my prior global position, I worked with more than 100 suppliers in excess of 30 distributors and eight production locations. I greatly relied on secondary information from these facilities. When you count on others to relay information, you run the risk of being misstated, either accidentally or intentionally. Largely because of cost factors, auditors obtain indirect background information from sites that they will visit. Too often, this information creates a distorted picture of what auditors find when they make their site visit. Next are information overload. As companies grow, so does the volume of their transactions and reports. This increases auditors' chances of not getting data that they need because it can't be found or obtaining incorrect data. In addition to these two issues, oddities are not always happy to see auditors. There is no doubt that oddities feel a certain amount of stress during an audit, which lead to hostility. I find that stress levels come from two factors not knowing what an auditor is like and when an operation functions without much order and direction. 
I believe that if you base your operation on clear standards and adopt a spirit of continual improvement, you should do well in any audit. Preparation is the key. This concludes our discussion today on standards and audits. I hope you found the information interesting.